Well, welcome to everybody to this uh, seminar uh, in which we will learn about the very high energy gamma rays uh, detection of uh, the recurrent uh, NOVA RS of Yuki, which was performed with the MAGIC telescope uh, um, in, uh, last, uh, during last August. Let, let me introduce uh, our speaker, uh, Young uh, uh, researcher uh, now in uh, uh, Padova, and uh, he uh, um, performed uh, his uh, PhD uh, in uh, IFAI, Barcelona. Then he had to wait in the, um, working with the uh, atmospheric, uh, uh, in, with the Cherenkov telescope uh, magic. Then he moved to the Max Planck Institute for Kern Physique in uh, Heidelberg. Uh, working with Oak experiment and studying about uh, um, the uh, production, the origin and the um, diffusion of uh, cosmic rays. Then uh, back with us in Magic uh, and uh, joining Padova with several uh, uh, appointments. Now he's a Fellini fellow and he's uh, continuing uh, his studies of cosmic rays within CTA and Magic. So I leave uh, the um, uh, I, I leave the the show to uh, Ruben Lopez Cotto, and uh, uh, let's uh, uh, learn something about this new intriguing uh, gamma ray source. Please. Well, thank you very much, uh, Vincenzo, for the introductions. Thank you uh, to, for the organizers for allowing me to give this talk here. And uh, well, special thanks to you, Vincenzo, for considering me a, a young researcher. <laughs> this <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> so I let me start uh, uh, sharing the presentation. Uh, Sorry. So I hope that uh, you can see that. Could you confirm it, please? Yes, I can see. Very good. OK, so <clears throat> over here you have the, the the title of the presentation. It is a well, very high energy gamma ray detection of RS of Yuki with the magic telescopes that uh, I put the, this uh, subtitle that it is the first evidence of a uh, proton acceleration in a NOVA system and uh, well since uh, I was told that, uh, that there would be a, a bit of a mixed background uh, uh, with in this uh, audience I, I decided to well first of all let me flash you with the outline of uh, this talk uh, and I will be I will be starting uh, uh, giving a brief introduction about uh, what the cataclysmic variable stars are and especially NOVI uh, describing the, and them uh, very briefly, and then I will also give a, a brief introduction about uh, well, gamma ray astronomy, the imaging atmospheric channel of technique that uh, we used in order to perform these observations, especially focused on the magic telescopes. And uh, finally, I will move to the description of the of the observations we carried out with uh, um, with magic, or the campaign, the, the modeling of uh, the source. The, the modeling of the origin of the emission and uh, especially the comparison to other novi in order to uh, in order to see if we can expect uh, this very high energy gamma ray emission coming from other objects so with that said uh, let me start uh, putting you here this slide on on the, a very very brief description of uh, what cataclysmic variable stars are so basically, cat cataclysmic variable stars, uh, they are uh, basically a white dwarf uh, with a companion star. So white dwarf, uh, I hope that uh, you know uh, what it is. It is uh, well, uh, uh, the remnant of, uh, of a more massive star that uh, did not have a, a mass large enough in order to uh, undergo a supernova. And then this uh, white dwarf, they can be associated to uh, to other stars in the, for example, in in the, in the image that I'm putting over here, you can find on the right the white dwarf and then the, uh, a main sequence companion, a red giant, uh, whatever. So in principle, the, from these cataclysmic variable stars, there are very different types and uh, they had outbursts observed uh, uh, in energies ranging from radio 
up to X-rays, but since 10 years ago, there were reports also of uh, gamma rays uh, uh, emitted from um, these objects. So gamma rays, they imply that uh, there are ultra relativistic, ultra relativistic particles accelerated over there. And therefore, the, well, the, there were a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, whether th those particles are electrons or they are protons and the maximum energies up to which uh, the, these objects uh, can accelerate these particles and so on and so forth. So as I said, uh, there are several types of, uh, of these objects. Uh, uh, you, you, can, uh, you can see here they are divided basically into Classical novi, depending on the depending on the origin of the um, on the origin of the emission that, that we are seeing. So if there is a thermal nuclear explosion, you have this classical novi. If they repeat, they are call, called recurrent novi. If the origin of the emission is uh, is uh, a gravitational, not a thermonuclear explosion, they are called dwarf novi. There are also some uh, uh, objects that uh, look like novi, but uh, they have not. Uh, uh, outbursts are uh, known and they are called nova-like variables. And if the origin, uh, well, if the white dwarf is uh, is a magnet, uh, it has a very high magnetic field, they are called magnetic uh, cataclysmic variables. So this is just to tell you that the, the fauna is uh, is quite large, but uh, in which uh, in the ones uh, we wanted to focus was uh, uh, on the on the novi. So novi. As I told you before, they are thermonuclear explosions caused basically by the accumulation of material on the surface of the white dwarf. So you basically over, over there on the, uh, the top right, you have uh, the white dwarf and the companion star. The white dwarf is accreting mater material from the companion star and uh, this material is uh, falling on top of the, of the white dwarf. Then this material is accumulating more and more and more and then at some point the white dwarf cannot stamp this uh, all this material being accumulated on the surface and it undergoes a very uh, a very big explosion these explosions they increase the brightness of the star in the optical and in other uh, at other wavelengths but especially in the optical they were discovered from uh, a, from magnitudes uh, ranging between uh, 6 and i think up to 19 so they they increase it is uh, it, it is a very large uh, increase and uh, they are usually they, they can be seen by the naked eye and that is how they they were discovered in several hundreds year ago years ago so novi they have uh, as uh, the rest of cataclysmic variable stars they have been extensively studied in the, in the optical in x rays radio and so on uh, and uh, if the if the companion, so this is important as, because if the companion of the white dwarf is a red giant, then uh, this uh, this uh, novi are called symbiotic novi because the wind is very is is very dense, the the wind coming from the companion star, and then you have a lot of target material, and of course this changes a lot the the way that uh, th that the the material can uh, interact after this uh, thermonuclear explosion. Then uh, I said uh, that uh, there are reports uh, from, uh, of, uh, of emission from uh, well, radio, optical, x-rays, and then since uh, 10, 12, 12 years ago, there are also reports of uh, gamma rays. And actually, they were already predicted uh, somehow that, that there could be some uh, GEV emission, there could be shocks in this thermonuclear explosion that uh, could uh, imply the acceleration of ultra relativistic particles that uh, could produce uh, gamma rays, as for example, you can see in the paper that I'm quoting over there, but it was of course not, uh, not proved until, uh, until we, saw, uh, um, we saw GV emission in uh, Fermilat that uh, I will be describing in more detail uh, uh, later. So, so with this, uh, let me just uh, flash you with this uh, with this map in, in, that you can see in galactic coordinates. Uh, so over there, the first uh, nova that uh, that is in principle accepted uh, to be a nova is it, it dates back to 1612. Well, there, there are actually some discussions of uh, whether. This, uh, this this was a real one. Not uh, basically in the 1600s, novi were discovered, and uh, with the years, I'm gonna put you this uh, in this gif. You can see that uh, there are all these uh, novi flashing uh, uh, flashing here and there. These are galactic coordinates. Remember, 
here the galactic plane is uh, at uh, at a latitude zero most of them are concentrated on the galactic plane because they are uh, they are of course galactic and i wanted to stop uh, this uh, gif on uh, 2009 because th those are all the the novi that uh, were discovered again in the optical in uh, in x-rays uh, and so on but from 2010 on there was the discovery of gamma ray emission from Novi. And the first one was uh, was V407 seq that was actually a symbiotic nova. So remember that I told you before what is a symbiotic nova. So it is a classical nova in which the companion star is a red giant. So the the wind from the companion is a, is very strong. Then you have a lot of a lot of particles there, a lot of protons that are coming from the companion, and then there is a lot of target material. So it was thought, okay, then uh, it, it it could be, or it is very likely that uh, what is accelerated in the nova shock is uh, are those are protons, and they they would be uh, with the collision with the, all the target material, they would they would be producing all these gamma rays. Unfortunately, the the um, with the spectrum that was measured, uh, it was it couldn't be determined for for sure. And then there was a, a lot of speculation. And there was more speculation even later when uh, not only gamma rays from a symbiotic nova came, but uh, remember, so you you can see over there that I'm pointing uh, that uh, we are in the year 2010. But if we go forward now, we see that in 2012 and so on and so forth there were more novi detected uh, in gamma rays and these are not uh, these are not uh, symbiotic novi anymore these are classical novi so in the in a classical nova you don't have a, so the, you don't have this uh, red giant that uh, that is providing all this uh, wind of particles and then you only have the the, the photosphere with uh, a lot of photons over there so the, the could as well be that uh, uh, that there are electrons that are accelerated over there and they are inverse quantum scattering all these uh, photons from the photosphere and producing this gamma ray emission. So, uh, so unfortunately, so I will flash uh, this to you later. This uh, still until until now, uh, we could not uh, determine for sure what were the the particles that are accelerated over there. And then finally, in year 2021, the 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 last uh, symbiotic nova that I'm putting you over there is Ares Opiuki, that is the one that we detected not only in Fermi but also in very high energy gamma rays. First time that it that uh, such a, an object was detected uh, at uh, such high energies. So. With this, I finish with uh, the, description, the description of a novi in gamma rays. So, uh, as I was telling to, to you before, they were discovered in 2010 uh, with a symbiotic nova. Then later, there were also classical novi. And uh, unfortunately, as you can see over here on the on the plot on the, on the right, you can see that either uh, a spectrum described by I by a uh, Pion decay model, so protons accelerated and uh, protons accelerating over there and uh, producing pi zeros that uh, would produce the gamma rays that we are seeing, or an uh, inverse Compton uh, uh, plus Bremsstrahlung uh, spectrum, so basically electrons accelerating over there and inverse Compton scattering the photons from the photosphere, they were both able to fit the, the data that, uh, that Fermi measured over there. So, the the explanation of electrons or protons accelerated in novi were both valid and we didn't know what uh, what was really going on there so <clears throat> with this i i finished my introduction about uh, novi about about uh, novi in uh, gamma rays or in low energy gamma rays and uh, now let me uh, let me give you a brief introduction of uh, what is the technique that uh, we used in order to perform the observations i'm gonna i'm gonna be describing in more detail later so with this let me start very basic with the electromagnetic spectrum you know we start in, in uh, radio up to very high energy gamma rays here in this slide i wanted to put to, to put to you all the observatories that uh, that are already taking data or that uh, will be taking data in the in the future in different uh, wavelengths so you have a SKA, ALMA, uh, uh, the ELT, or in very high energy gamma rays, we will have 
with uh, what is called the Cherenkov Telescope Array Observatory. So that uh, I will not talk uh, about uh, about CDA now uh, in detail because uh, that that is uh, <laughs> that is basically material for for another talk. But uh, just for for you to know that uh, when we are talking about uh, gamma rays or the gamma rays that I was talking about before. Uh, those are in the range of hundreds of MeV and GeV, but uh, with the imaging atmospheric Cherenkov telescope technique, we are going to hundreds of GeV or even TeV uh, energies. So, and uh, how how does this technique work? So basically, here you have a uh, uh, Cherenkov telescope. Uh, in which uh, basically what uh, you are doing is uh, you are observing the, the sky during the night and uh, whenever gamma rays arrive to the atmosphere they they undergo an electron positron pair and uh, they undergo a, a, a particle cascade that in, illuminates uh, a, a very large area on the ground so basically this is what uh, you have here we have very large light pools and we have the, these uh, very large reflectors that are able to detect these uh, uh, these uh, images. So we produce images of uh, these events, and with uh, these images that uh, you can see over here, over here, you have a pixelized camera that is basically made of, uh, uh, of photo detectors, either photomultiplier tubes, silicon PMs, or whatever. And using the information that is contained in these images, we are able to reconstruct what is the uh, what what is uh, what are the properties of the uh, of the particle that produce that image. So basically, for example, here we can reconstruct uh, the direction from which uh, this. Uh, um, from which this uh, um, this particle came, then uh, we can uh, we can say whether it is uh, uh, it is it was produced by a gamma ray or it was produced by a proton, and we can also reconstruct what is the energy of this uh, of this event. So <clears throat> with all this, we can measure gamma rays with a very large collection area, and. And uh, with that, what we do is to reconstruct the spectrum and the light curve and so on of these kind of sources. So, at, uh, so I told you before that uh, at the moment we are constructing the next generation of uh, these kind of instruments that uh, that is called the Cherenkov Telescope Array Observatory. But uh, currently in the world there are there are arrays that are that are working that have been working for the last couple of decades. Uh, using these techniques, and uh, this uh, the main protagonists uh, at the moment are these three. The first one that you can see has that uh, is composed of uh, five telescopes, four small ones, and a very large one in at the center of the array. Then we have Magic that I will describe to you in more detail uh, in the next slide and uh, we also have uh, Veritas. They are located uh, one in Namibia, another one in uh, La Palma and uh, another one in the desert of uh, Arizona. So we are covering the northern and the southern uh, hemispheres with uh, those. So <clears throat> basically here you have the description of the magic telescopes. So there are three arrays in the world uh, and uh, two of them detected this event has telescopes and also the magic ones that I will be describing to you the magic telescopes because they are the ones we we use in order to carry out these observations. So over there you have the the two magic telescopes with uh, with the Garante can on the uh, on the back. So, so the magic collaboration is a collaboration of uh, more than 170 people in 12 countries. So we operate a, a stereo system of two imaging atmospheric Cherenkov telescopes for that uh, we've been operating them for almost a couple of decades. Uh, the, the main kind of characteristics of the system or how it, the system was built it was to have a large reflector in order to target the lowest possible energies and uh, to be lightweight in order to have a very fast movement to be able to catch uh, gamma ray bursts as, as the one that uh, as, as a very famous one that uh, we caught uh, in uh, January uh, January 
thanks to the very fast movement of uh, of uh, this um, uh, of these telescopes. So Magic is located in, in the Canary Island of uh, La Palma. You can see over there uh, in the map. You have the Canary Islands. Uh, you have uh, over there La Palma, and at the top of the of the Canary Island of La Palma. You have the observatory of the Roque de los Muchachos, in which, uh, that is located at uh, an altitude of 2,200 meters above uh, sea level. And uh, if you haven't been there, I invite you to go because uh, it has one of the clearest sky in the world. And uh, if uh, if you go there and uh, you are during the night and you you go out and just to uh, you have a clear night then uh, the the sky is really astonishing it is uh, something really really beautiful so magic uh, so uh, as i said uh, we have uh, two telescopes we are uh, we have large reflectors larger than the, the than the the telescopes from uh, uh, hess and veritas and it was uh, the, the target of these uh, very large reflectors was to to try to uh, to achieve the lowest possible energy threshold and uh, we have a trigger energy threshold that it, that is of the order of a uh, 50 giga electron volt and uh, an energy resolution of the order 15 to 23 percent an angular resolution of a uh, smaller than 0.07 degrees and the sensitivity that uh, you can see over there in this plot that it evolved over the years with the construction of another telescope, with the upgrading of the system, the upgrading of the of the analysis, uh, and so on and so forth. With all that, we are reaching a sensitivity now that is of the order of 0.6% of the Crab Nebula flux in uh, 50 hours. That is uh, that is actually pretty good compared to the to our competitors. Sorry. So with this, I hope that uh, it was clear for you the, the introduction about uh, MAGIC. And uh, with this, uh, I finished the introduction of uh, NOVI, the introduction of uh, imaging, the Imaging Atmospheric Cherenkov Technique and MAGIC. And now let me combine both uh, and, <clears throat> and start talking about uh, NOVI with uh, MAGIC. So the, the NOVA program with uh, MAGIC, uh, it's been uh, it's been running for a very long time. So it it actually started almost when I started my PhD. So uh, basically, when uh, whenever Fermi detected this uh, symbiotic nova in 2010, we have uh, we have some uh, collaborators that uh, uh, that uh, well, got uh, really excited about that, and uh, they actually wrote a, a paper. So Julian Sitarik. Who is, uh, who, who is from, well, some of you may, may know him. Uh, they, they wrote this uh, paper, Sitarek and Bednarek, in uh, 2012, I think, in which they were they, they were performing predictions of what we would be able to see with MAGIC if the uh, the lower energy emission from Fermi was uh, was emitted by some kind of a particle. So uh, under some particular conditions, uh, they were predicting that uh, at very high energy gamma rays, we would be able to see uh, to, to detect them with magic. Therefore, we submitted a proposal and then uh, we we started uh, following up no, some novi that uh, that, that uh, were fulfilling some uh, criteria. Let's say so. So over there, you have uh, we we actually observed uh, over the years several different novi. We observed classical novi, symbiotic novi, dwarf novi. Uh, they were observed in the past, uh, and uh, actually we caught one of uh, the good ones, one of the uh, the ones that I was putting to you in the animated GIF that I showed you before, and. Uh, that was a v 339 del that that is the the best one we actually caught it during sorry we caught it during the um, um during the eruption and uh, we observed it we unfortunately weren't able to detect it but uh, the upper limits we put were very constraining and uh, over there you have the plot um, uh, um, of the spectral energy distribution you have the the Fermi results uh, with that are those crosses, and uh, then uh, the magic upper limits are the uh, the black squares. 
So with that, we were able to, in the, in the framework of the model of uh, um, Citarek and Bednarek, we were able to say that if the low energy emission from Fermi was coming from electrons, uh, then uh, we, would, we were able to put a constraint on the, the amount of protons that uh, were accelerated in that nova that uh, had to be smaller than 10% that of electrons. And that, that was uh, already a, a good thing. And it already demonstrated that uh, we were able to uh, to react fast and uh, to be able to observe the NOVA right uh, during the during the eruption. Actually, we started observing this one even before it was reported uh, by Fermi because it was very bright in optical. So as I said, uh, over there you have the reference of the paper that uh, we published uh, uh, in, uh, in 2015. And over the years, we were following up, up other events, not so interesting as uh, as this one, and without any detection. And that was and that was like this until last summer. So last summer, RSOP uh, that, that uh, well, uh, here you have the uh, a brief description. Uh, it is a recurrent nova in a symbiotic binary. It has outbursts uh, during uh, every. Uh, every 15, 20 years, more or less. So the last one, the the, the last two previous one was in 2006. So it was already more or less due time for it to erupt again. Uh, it is located by uh, at a distance of, uh, well, that, that is debated between 1.4 and 4.3 kiloparsec, uh, depending on what, uh, on what is the uh, depending on what is the, the measurements that uh, you use you know, to determine this uh, distance. And well, th there are two important things. The first one is that in 2006, when uh, there was the last eruption before the 2021 one, uh, there, were, there weren't satellites that were sensitive enough in order to, in order to detect it in uh, gamma rays. And then in uh, the night of August uh, 8th, 2021, it uh, erupted. So in here I'm going to put you uh, the timeline of RSOP for very high energy gamma rays. And uh, well, basically you can see over there, it. Uh, so the optical discovery was in the, the night of the, from 8 to 9 of August. Then uh, Fermilat also detected it and published an ATL. And after seeing the ATL by Fermilat, we decided to request observations uh, with MAGIC. So unfortunately, we cannot observe during the day, of course, because with MAGIC we can only observe during the night. So we had to wait until that night. And HES actually started observation before than MAGIC because, uh, because of, well, the, 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 they are in the Southern Hemisphere and uh, they, could, uh, they could start observing before. And uh, we started observation and, uh, at uh, uh, at 10:30 in the in the night, and uh, the next day has uh, submitted an ATL in which they were claiming that uh, they had the, they had detected RSOPUK, and uh, with magic we carried out the analysis and we we also uh, detected it and continued obser observing it. And they, these are the results I'm going to be showing to you in a moment. So basically, so RSOP with magic uh, since the night of uh, the night of August, it was uh, detected and uh, characterized by magic over its peak emission. So, <clears throat> so let me start here with the light curve that uh, we measured. So with magic, we observed RSOP for four consecutive nights. So you can see over there in red the the um, the integral flux from magic daily so per night and this is what uh, we we detected every night for integral flux above uh, for energies above uh, 100 gv unfortunately we kept observing the source but uh, we started to have uh, bad weather and there was uh, in summer it is very common that uh, we have uh, kalima that is the, that this uh, uh, this uh, dust that is coming from uh, the Sahara Desert. It comes sometimes to the Canary Islands and it, uh, then the observations become very difficult. 
and uh, we weren't able to detect it uh, anymore. Then afterwards, the, uh, we, we kept observing actually, but uh, those data are basically not uh, usable, unfortunately. Then later it came the moon period in which uh, when there is a strong moon, we usually close the, the telescope for a, for a few nights. And then afterwards, we kept observing the source, but uh, we weren't able to detect it. And you can see over there, we have, a, we have the upper limits and all the, the joint upper limits for the period after this uh, um, for, for the period after this uh, moon break. So in principle, what we detected with magic, that is uh, this, uh, this flux over the first four days is uh, compatible with a con constant. And uh, afterwards, we weren't able to, uh, to detect anything. So this is what we saw with magic. And, uh, and well, um, well uh, first of all, sorry, I forgot to say, so uh, well, all these results, they, they are already, you, you can find them on the archive. We uploaded the, the paper already. Unfortunately, so we, we scheduled this presentation because we were pretty sure that uh, the paper would be published by, by the time of the presentation, uh, unfortunately, this was not the case. The publish will, will uh, the, sorry, the paper will actually be published uh, tomorrow. So uh, tomorrow, the actually these results are still under embargo, and uh, but well, I, I can show them. And, but uh, but basically, the paper will will not be will not be officially published until tomorrow. Anyway, I say if you want to check something, just go to that reference that I'm uh, giving over there and you can find all the details. So well, I showed you the, the light curve uh, that we measure with magic, but uh, let me move to put everything into, into context uh, of, uh, uh, on the multi-wavelength regime. So with magic, I told you that the first four days we measure something that is compatible with a constant, uh, but uh, this is not the case for uh, measurements in, uh, in other wavelengths. Basically, because uh, well, with magic, of course, it, it should have been uh, decreasing with time at some point, but uh, we weren't able to, to see it, unfortunately, because of this uh, bad weather that we talk about. And basically, we have a, a fast decay in the optical and in Fermi that, uh, that, that is pretty compatible, uh, both of them, and uh, that are, are actually very helpful in the in the determination of which, uh, which type of particles are um, are actually accelerated over there. So, <clears throat> so before moving to the to the discussion about uh, which type of particles are accelerated in, into the into this event, let me first put Arezzo Puke into context with the uh, other novi. I told you that uh, there are several novi that have been detected by Fermi. Uh, since 2010, and uh, none of them were were actually detected in uh, the very high energy gamma ray regime. So why is this the case? Why is is Arezzo Puke so special? Uh, are we seeing a very high energy gamma rays because this is a special uh, type of source or something, or or what is the uh, what's the deal with uh, this source? So. In order to do that, uh, the, the only way of, of doing it was to putting it into context uh, with the measurements performed for other novi. And uh, this is what uh, you can see over here in this figure on the, well, on, on the right. You see basically the location of uh, all novi uh, in the galactocentric uh, coordinates. And uh, you can see that well, no, no, RSO Puke is not in a in in no special position or anything there, is, there may be some clustering towards the the galactic center but it is just because there are more um, there are more sources over there uh, when, when you go to towards the galactic center than when you uh, when you look uh, to the to the backwards part but uh, nothing really special about that but on the left plot uh, you can see the spectral energy distribution of the different novi that were detected by Fermi, and uh, well, also we plot together the the measurement of RSO Puke by by magic. So you can see that uh, well, RSO Puke is uh, somehow special because he's the one with the highest flux. Uh, 
all this uh, all, all, from all this novi you can see that uh, well during the the period coincident with magic you can see a very high flux from fermi but even if you make the average over the whole eruption eruption um uh, Ares of Buki is the one with the highest flux, but it is not only the one with the highest flux, it is also the one that is intrinsically brightest. And uh, you can see over, over here on the right, the two plots I'm putting that uh, is the number of photons and the total energy as a function of the emission duration. You can see that there is more or less uh, some trend that actually is, is not significant uh, because it was it was claimed not to be significant by the Fermi collaboration in the paper they they studied this uh, of this trend that they, that uh, seems to be for the uh, for the classical novi going uh, down for the total energy and number of photos as a function of the emission duration but in any case you can see that the symbiotic novi are are actually not following that so it could it could as well be that uh, that uh, all the other novi are basically very similar, but uh, RSOP is uh, simply that it is well, it has a higher flux, and the higher flux it may only be related to the distance at which the source is, and it has it, it is also it is also brighter, but it is just slightly brighter than the others, so not so so special. Only the uh, only the only going outside of this trend because it is a symbiotic nova and it is uh, slightly different from the others. But uh, but let me let me try to uh, let me try to make the prediction of uh, of the very high energy gamma ray emission from other novae. Why didn't we observe any very high energy gamma ray emission from other novae? So well. The the thing is that uh, here what I'm what I'm putting uh, on the left is a plot of uh, first of all what I'm uh, what I draw in uh, in red is the are the they are the results uh, from Arezzo Piuki either with Fermi and with Magic and in blue I'm putting the comparison to two other novi that were observed in very high energy gamma rays. The first one is the first symbiotic nova V4076 uh, that was observed by Veritas, and the one below is V339 del that was observed by Magic, as I told you before. And uh, you can see over there what uh, uh, what we did was to actually scale down the flux that we see that we are seeing with uh, uh, with Fermi and Magic for RSOP Uki, and we put in gray this scale flux. Why do we do this? What we want to do here is to compare what is the so the, the flux. It may only be related to the distance at which the source is. It, it doesn't tell you anything intrinsically about the source. So what we what we wanted to see is whether the upper limits that uh, we measure for these sources were compatible with uh, with a spectrum from uh, these these sources v339 l and v407 seq that uh, so, uh, were compatible with the spectrum that uh, that we measure from them so you can see over there that for the for the gray points so all of them fall below the upper limits that were established by veritas um, for V4076 and by magic for V339 del. It means that uh, for all the previous novi that ha have ever been uh, observed in very high energy gamma rays, it could as well be that simply the, that they were emitting uh, an exactly the same flux that, uh, sorry, that with the same spectral shape that we measure for Ares of Beauty. It was just that the, the flux level was not high enough for us to see it. But uh, it could it could as well be that uh, they are exactly the same as Ares of Buki. So it would mean that Ares of Buki is no special at all. And we uh, there are many other novi out there that could be detected at the very high energy gamma rays. It could as well be that classical novi, not only symbiotic ones, are also emitting in very high energy gamma rays. But it is just, uh, it would be just that uh, we did not have instruments that were sensitive enough in order to detect them. And hopefully, with the advent of uh, uh, the Cherenkov Telescope Array, we will be able to, to do that. But now let me 
<laughs> go back to the to the to the main point of this uh, presentation, or at least the subtitle that I put uh, on this presentation. It was the type of particle that uh, was accelerated in this uh, uh, in this event. So we know that there are acceler that there are relativistic particles. We have low energy gamma rays. We have very high energy gamma rays. So there have to be uh, relativistic particles over there accelerated. But, uh, but are they protons or are they electrons? And uh, this this is important to to uh, to distinguish between them. And uh, well, what we put forward in our paper is that uh, that uh, there's there's no simply particle acceleration. There they are protons. Protons are the ones that are being accelerated in this uh, in Novi explosion. And and why is that? So I, I'm going to put you here some uh, some proofs. Let's say, but if if you want more details, yes, please go to the to our paper. So well, why do we favor protons over electrons? Well, first of all. It, it is a it is a matter of uh, what is more natural. So if you inject protons uh, in order to to be able to explain uh, and you evolve them uh, and so on and so forth, in order to be able to explain the emission that uh, we are uh, that we are seeing. So with protons, it is very natural. You can inject them with a very natural minus two spectral index. And uh, you let them evolve, and you get uh, a fit to your data. That is the red line. While for electrons, it is not so natural. You you re you require first of all an ad hoc uh, spectral break, so you cannot inject the electrons with a sing single power law and make them evolve because otherwise you overshoot the energies at the uh, the, the low energies. Then you you need to add a a, a spectral break, and then even like that, uh, you you need to inject them with a uh, with a very unnatural spectral index. So so it, it doesn't come so uh, so naturally. So this is the first proof. Then, uh, well, the second one is the the chi square. Even putting the electrons with this ad hoc uh, spectral break uh, and, and uh, so on, then you don't get uh, uh, you don't get a fit that is as good as the one uh, we get with uh, protons. So the chi square of the fit is much better for protons. You can see that on the left than the, the one for electrons on the right. So this is the, the the second proof. Then uh, there is also the, there is also the um, the evolution of the maximum energy with time. So I told you that uh, the the flux that uh, magic measure is actually constant uh, with uh, uh, well it is uh, in the daily light curve it is uh, it is a constant uh, flux. But uh, this doesn't mean that uh, the maximum energy of the underlying particles is actually constant and because of course these particles you need to inject them they evolve and so on and so forth so here there is a, a hint of spectral hard hardening in the in the energy of the protons that uh, you can see over there of course you can fit it everything with a constant but uh, the fit is not as good as uh, with this increasing energy over time and uh, with uh, uh, with electrons, uh, well, it is not so uh, it is not so uh, straight. Uh, it wouldn't be so straightforward that that is needs to be uh, increasing with uh, with time. They they cool down very fast uh, and so on. So, so it is it, it would be something uh, different than that. And then there is also the evolution of the optical and the and the high energy emission. So they actually follow a very similar decay, and for the inverse Compton emission, so produced by electrons, it would be it, it, they should follow a, 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 a decay that is uh, different uh, because because of the photosphere expansion uh, uh, and so on that would make the the electrons to uh, or the spectrum produced by electrons to decay faster than the one produced by uh, by protons. Uh, that is the the image that uh, you can see here on the right, <coughs> the, the integral flux uh, versus the um, the optical one. And uh, well, basically with this uh, we uh, we arrive to the so we have all these uh, these protons that uh, that uh, we have put forward. We said that uh, we favor them, but are so, and we also know that uh, we have all these cosmic rays from which we don't know 
what is the, the real origin uh, um, uh, and so on. We measure them here at the Earth, but uh, we don't we don't know uh, where they are coming from. In principle, the, what we what is favored uh, in the in the literature is that they are accelerated in supernovae or supernova explosions and uh, and the remnants of these supernova explosions. But uh, here we are demonstrating that uh, there are protons that are efficiently ac uh, accelerated and injected into the interstellar medium by this novi. But uh, here, if you make the calculations, I will not go into very much detail here, but uh, it is true that uh, this novi, they accelerate protons. Most of their energy go into protons, but, uh, but uh, compared to the ones that are produced by supernova remnants, it is a very small fraction, uh, over less than 0.2%, and also the region over, they, over which they dominate over the sea of cosmic rays that uh, we have is a very small one of the order of one or less than 10 parsecs in, in every case. So they are actually not dominating over very large regions. So unfortunately, galactic cosmic rays, they are very likely to come from other sources. And with this, I arrive to my conclusions. So well, the take home message is that, uh, well, first of all, magic observed and detected Ares of Yuki. And uh, Ares of Yuki actually opens a new class of uh, very high energy gamma ray sources, Novi. So first of all, symbiotic Novi, but th there could be other Novi uh, over there emitting in very high energy gamma rays. And actually, it could be the case because Ares of Yuki does not have to be particularly special. It is just that it is bright and there could be more out there. So we need to keep observing this, uh, uh, this, uh, this type of sources. And uh, finally, just uh, to point out that uh, we, we, uh, we strongly favor that uh, the particles that are accelerated in these events are protons and these protons they even, will eventually escape the nova shock and contribute to the cosmic crazy but unfortunately the the main contributors cannot be this type of objects and there have to be other ones such as uh, supernovae supernova remnants or or other other types of objects and uh, that's it thank you